all right everyone so in this video here i wanted to talk about this because let's just face it internally in xbox there is something going on that apparently they're trying to keep it internally but more and more things are slowly starting to come out and it's pretty evident, even with the release of Redfall, that yes, internally, there's an issue going on when it comes to first-party games. Because let's just remember, Bethesda games are technically first-party games. There is an issue going on. There is a lack of communication and there's a lack of resources going on where... Xbox is allowing games like Redfall to still be released. And I'll I'll just say this, I played I played Redfall for a little bit. I am generally shocked and I played some really bad games. I'm generally shocked especially for a first party game how piss poor Redfall is. I don't I don't understand how they can just let a game like that be released. Either delay the game or be like, you know what? We tried and tried. This game is not to our quality standards. We are flat out canceling the game. And we're going to have the team basically restart on the new project. I think that alone, if they'd done that instead, would have let people know it's like, hey... There is an issue with this game. Clearly, it was not up to quality. they rather just cancel it, cut their losses, and just have them restart on a brand new project. For me personally, I would have more respect for that. Look at what Nintendo did with uh, Metroid Prime 4. How many years ago that game was first announced, and then Nintendo eventually came out and admitted, it's like, hey, this game is not to our quality standards. We don't want to release a product that is not up to quality of what we expect for a Nintendo first party game. Uh, we're basically going to re relaunch or redo the game from scratch. Microsoft should have done that with Redfall, honestly. But there is a segment through Kind of Funny Games that a lot of people are talking about. And I'm going to play this clip. And I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to rattle off a couple quick ones with you, Phil. Of course, we talk about 60 frames, 30 frames. Should Xbox players expect a clear message this summer with Starfield with 30 and 60 frames? That's a big lesson learned, as you brought up. Should we expect that answer as clear as day? Yeah. Okay, that's a great one. Uh, another one, uh, you see a lot of conversation, of course. I want to praise you and the team for really elevating the PC side of this Xbox ecosystem. I think we've seen a lot of great strides in that. But when you see the community talk about the console side of things, do you think you've lost the focus or maybe put too much onto the PC side? Do you think that the console is still getting the console love that it deserves, whether it be the homepage update, achievements, of course, looking forward and using the power of this next gen? Do you think you guys have lost that focus or is it still there? And can we see more love on that side? Well, we'll definitely continue to focus on on making our console experience as, as great as it can be. I like the the homepage refresh and some stuff. I will say this might be disruptive as well. Um, we have a different vision. You know, Paris talked about this. It's play the games you want with the people you want anywhere you want. We want Xbox to be something that people who buy our console can feel like they're a member of. Obviously who are playing on PC, who are playing on cloud, that they feel like, feel like they're full members um, of our ecosystem. Game Pass players can play um, on many different devices, and, and we remain fully committed to that. One thing I'm going to add about Game Pass. One of the selling points of Game Pass is the fact that you can get first-party games at launch. If Microsoft continues to basically release absolute garbage first-party games... What is the point of Game Pass at that point? What what what's the reason? 
And just for full disclosure, yes, I do have an Xbox Series X, and I actually do have a Series S as a secondary console in another place in my house. But I also do subscribe to Game Pass Ultimate, based on the $15 a month service. And every once in a while, I do use the cloud service. You know, I do have a G Cloud here. You know, Logitech G Cloud where it is designed as a cloud gaming handheld. For what that thing does, it actually works really well. Now, my biggest problem right now is the fact that even though I don't have a PS5 anymore, but I can understand or that I do know that basically the majority of Sony's first party games and I'm going to throw Nintendo in this too. The majority of first party Nintendo games also. For the most part, it's all top quality stuff. Why is Microsoft's first party stuff, as of late, more misses than hits? Why is that? Why is it that the only real studios that are pretty much rock solid are... The Forza games. And, you know, for, for the most part, somewhat solid is the uh, Gears franchise. In term, Save where you want about those games. I'm just talking about on a quality level. Why is it that is basically Forza and Gears really the two franchises right now from Xbox where it is like legitimate quality level? Why is it pretty much everything else coming out from Microsoft is absolute garbage? Yes, I d for anyone that asks, it's like, yes, I am aware of uh, Pentiment. I think that's what that game is called. That one is supposed to be good. And uh, Hi-Fi Rush is supposed to be another solid game. But those are more like... Those are more like indie the double-A style games they're not really meant as like full price $70 games by the way Redfall was released in a completely broken mess that honestly should not have been released for $70 yes I am aware of that for game pass subscribers you can just play it but if you go to steam if you go to epic games or you just want to buy the game itself on Xbox, it's $70. It's Microsoft's first $70 game and it's absolute garbage. Here's my biggest thing when it comes to first party games, and this is regardless of whatever platform it is. The whole point of first party games, not only you know, for more games, of course, but it's a first party game. It's meant to basically take full advantage of the hardware for the most part. And it's supposed to be your top quality stuff. I do understand every once in a blue moon, you might just have a complete dud of a game, but it doesn't make sense now in 2023 that even Nintendo with the switch hardware, why is it that um, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, even though it's on much weaker hardware than the than Redfall on the Series X or even on the PC for that matter, why is it that even visually Zelda looks better than Redfall? It's supposed to be on Unreal Engine 4 for Redfall. And it's obviously on much higher, uh, a much more powerful console. But why is it the game looks pretty piss poor? And why does the gameplay suck so badly? By the way, just on the side note, I'm noticing a handheld right here. I'm wondering what that is. I wonder if that's the... Uh, that ROG device. I, I, I'm getting off track here. Anyway, the point is, why is it that Sony and Nintendo, 
are able to just release games that are really, really solid titles. And Microsoft is the only one out of the three major console manufacturers that is having a hard time releasing quality games. Why is it? And you know what? Like I said before, I don't have a PS5 anymore. I do have a gaming PC. I have a Switch. And of course, I have an Xbox. But why is it that Microsoft is the only one that is actually having legitimate issues trying to release quality games? Why is it when they announce a new game, say like... Um, um, a new Perfect Dark game that's supposed to be from the studio, from their new studio that's designed, that was built to be a quadruple A studio. Why is it now that you're basically having the team that worked on Tomb Raider help make the game now? I mean. You know what? I'm just going to say this too. And no, I'm not I'm not one of those people that think uh, Phil Spencer should be fired or anything because realistically who who are you supposed to be having running Xbox at this point? And on top of that, it's not Phil Spencer, it's not a Phil Spencer issue. It's more of the issue of management having a hands-off approach to game development. They need to start evaluating these games and be like, this game is crap. Scrap it, do something else. Or, or hell, I mean... Maybe Microsoft needs to seriously start like offering really, really high paying jobs specifically from people from Nintendo and Sony to be like, hey, um, anyone from those companies wants to come work for us. We have special titles that can uh, give us a little insight on how things should be done with all these studios, because apparently Whatever Nintendo is doing and whatever Sony is doing is clearly working, but the way Microsoft is doing things is not working at all. So I think two things needs to happen with Xbox. No, I'm not saying, you know, Microsoft needs to kill Xbox, get out of the gaming industry and all that stuff. There's way too much money um, for them to lose on it. And, Realistically, as a whole, as an entire company of Microsoft, Xbox is actually a very, very small business for them, but it is a profitable segment of their business. And it's a way to also communicate with the customers and basically just have like brain recognition when it comes to Microsoft, you know, outside of the whole corporate side of things and, you know, Windows. So... That's part of the reason why Microsoft wants to keep Xbox around. But if they keep doing crap like this, then all it's going to do is just start hurting their image. And most likely people are going to start thinking about it that, oh, they're having all these issues here. What about all this business stuff then? So, I don't know. Let's just continue with this. Um, We're not in the business of out consoling Sony or out consoling Nintendo. Um, there isn't, by the way, that, um, that quote right there. So if you're, if you're not trying to out console your competitors, then why are you trying to, why did you acquire Bethesda? And why are you trying to acquire Activision Blizzard King for six they acquired uh, Bethesda for like seven eight billion dollars and they're trying to acquire Activision for 69 billion dollars 
why why is Microsoft going to spend that kind of money if if Phil Spencer is going to be saying we're we're not trying to out we can't out counsel the competitors at this point. Why is that? It's like no. You're in the biz if you're selling consoles then you have to make sure that you try to push your console sales. And the way you do that is quality first party titles. And my biggest thing too about this and what really frustrates me with Xbox is that even with the 360, with the Xbox 360 days, Microsoft showed that yes, they can fire on all cylinders and have really, really kick-ass first-party titles. Why is it now, you know, going... I think what when they start having some serious problems when it comes to first-party titles is halfway through the Xbox One generation. And the reason why I say that, say what you want about the Xbox One, but when it comes to first-party titles... Especially the first half of the Xbox One, they actually had legitimate good first party games. The second half, they had a couple, but it started tearing off. And then all of a sudden, you know, jumping into the Xbox Series, you know, a much more capable platform than the Xbox One. But it just seems like the first party titles, like, it's almost like no one had their shit their stuff to get i was going to curse try not to curse it's almost like by the time the series x and the series s came out none of the series had anything ready to go it seems like it seems like microsoft's plan or at least you know the xbox division it seems like their plan was let's just release the console Games will eventually come, but you know, that's why it's a very similar experience from the Xbox one, you know, with the dashboard and most of the popular games, you know, it's just, you know, easily, you know, just starts playing on the, on the Xbox series consoles. So it seems like their plan was release the console. Yes. Uh, first party games, not entirely ready yet. So we're going to we're just going to release the console as is and then the games will be ready by then but it seems like having that hands off approach is not really working for you guys so maybe that's part of the reason why they're also trying to acquire Activisions because maybe they have people Say whatever you want about Activision, how they, you know, in terms of management, you know, how they treat the employees and stuff like that. What I will say is, at least with Activision, say whatever you want about the work environment. You know, I never worked for them. I can only go by the news articles. At the very least, you, I can tell you that the majority of Activision titles that has been released in the last several years is for the most part, been very rock solid titles. Okay? And I'm not strictly just talking about Call of Duty. You know, the Crash games, the Spiral games. Uh, hell, even the Tony Hawk's remake. You know, Tony Hawk's 1 and 2. That was a very solid title. So, maybe that's part of the reason why they're also interested in acquiring them. Now, I do understand that, you know, King, you know... Candy Crush, you know, makes a crap ton of money. I understand that. But, and supposedly that's one of the big reasons why Microsoft's trying to acquire them is mainly for King. But, I can bet you they also want people from the Activision side of things to be like, how are you guys pulling this off? That way we can get all of the other studios on the same page as you guys. I wouldn't be surprised if that's part of the reason why, but I mean, the way things are going right now, it's, 
they need to do something because this I don't want to say this has become a laughing stock, but the the fact that it's starting to become expected that oh another first party Xbox game, yeah, this is probably gonna be sh uh crap. Sorry, I was gonna curse again. Really a great solution or win for us. And I know that will upset a ton of people, but it's just the truth of the matter is that when you're third place in the console marketplace and the top two players are as strong as they are and have um, in certain cases a very very dis discreet focus on doing deals and other things that will um, that kind of make being Xbox hard for us as a team that's on us not on anybody else our vision is that everybody who's on console has to feel like they have a great experience and they're a first class citizen they've invested a ton in our platform but we are not in a position and I, I see it out there I see commentary that if you just build great games everything would turn around it's just not true that if we go off and build great games all of a sudden you're gonna see console share shift in some dramatic way we lost why do people buy Nintendo switches then why do why do people buy PS uh, PlayStation's Yes, I understand that, you know, when it comes to uh, the consoles, especially on the PlayStation side, it's like, well, I mean, you know, a lot of people play Call of Duty and Fortnite. Say what you want about those games. There's a lot of players that plays that game, those games, on PlayStation and on Xbox. But one of the things that Sony does is release quality first-party titles. The Switch does not have a Call of Duty game. And yet it sold over 100 million units. What is it, like 120 or so? 130? But why is it that on much weaker hardware, Nintendo first party game sells really, really well? Maybe that's because Nintendo tries to make sure that every single game that comes out is pretty much rock solid from the start and like any updates you know that is that are issues for the game is more like quality of life or you know like oh just little bugs here and there or you know something on the networking side of things you know if there's like an online component but or in some cases they just add more content over time to uh to games but it's not like Nintendo and Sony are releasing completely broken games from the start. I can tell you this, like, I think the last time Sony released a game that no one liked was that, um, what is that? Destruction All-Stars Derby, I think that's what it was called. And Sony, at the very last moment, probably realized, like, you know, this game is doesn't f seem like a $70 game. Let's just release it on PlayStation Plus. It's like a, you know, just like a freebie game for PlayStation members or PlayStation Plus members. And at least that game, say whatever you want about that game, but at least that game, when it came out, was a complete broken mess. The game, truthfully, wasn't all that fun. But it technically worked. There wasn't like any control issues. There wasn't any graphical issues. It seemed like it was a quality game. It's just or quality made game. It just there just wasn't much to the game. And and even Nintendo games. Say where you want about, you know, the new Zelda game being at $70, you know, for a Switch title. But you can tell that even at $70, you're still going to get your money's worth because it's going to be a very, very high quality game. It's going to be a lot of hours that you can that you can put into that game. You know, what's a to me personally, there's a $10 difference in terms of a game pricing. If you're still going to get 80 to 100 hours of gameplay out of a 60 or $70 game, then that $10 difference, honestly, to me, not that big of a deal. 
you're still going to get a crap ton of hours out of a game. But if you're spending $70 on a completely broken mess of a game like Redfall, why, why are you wanting to spend $70? Or why are you wanting to pay $15 a month for a service that one of the selling points is first party titles, but the first party titles that comes out is completely crap. The worst generation to lose in the Xbox one generation where everybody built their digital library of games. Um, so when, and yes, the only reason why game pass even exists is because Xbox realized, okay, we need, we need to have something to get people onto the Xbox platform. And that's why Game Game Pass exists. It's not because to give I mean, you know, to give like some kind of value or anything. It's more that to give some kind of incentive for people to have an Xbox account or have a Microsoft account for gaming. And that's where Game Pass comes in. That's the only reason why Game Pass exists. And I'm not saying Game Pass is a bad service or anything. I think it's a really good service. Even without the first party games. But the problem is, is that the incentive of Game Pass is first party titles being released on the service also day and date. But if the first party titles that comes out is garbage, then it really doesn't matter. When you go and you're building on Xbox, we want our Xbox community to feel awesome. But this idea that if we just focused more on great games on our console, that somehow we're going to win the console race, I think doesn't really lay to the reality of most people. Like 90% of the people every year who walk into a retailer to buy a console are already a member of one of the three ecosystems. And their digital library is there. This is the first generation where the big games that they're playing um, were games that were available last gen when you think about Fortnite and Roblox and Minecraft. Like the continuity from generation to generation is so strong. I see a lot of pundits out there that kind of want to go back to the time where we all had cartridges and discs. One of the one of the things you can do to bring over people from other platforms is quality first party games. That's how you do it. Okay. You know, if we go back to the Xbox 360 PS3 days, okay, one of the reasons why, and every new, one of the reasons why the 360 for most of the generation was very successful is because of two big things. One, the price of the console was cheaper than the PS3, and two, the first party titles on the PS3, especially from the start, wasn't all that great. So when you have really good first party titles coming out on the 360 and mediocre titles coming out on the PS3 during the during the first part of the gener of that generation, then yes, of course more people are going to go for the 360. This is mostly an excuse coming from him. Because it's been done before. It's been done before. So in games like Fortnite, for example, you can go on the Epic Games account and just link all, all of your um, your console platform credentials and it will just automatically sync everything. Mostly. In terms of like progress and you know, stuff like that. If you've played Fortnite before, you basically any, everything except uh, V-Bucks. But, so that's not really an excuse, okay? And it's, it's really frustrating, too, because for me personally, I've, all, like, when it comes to the controller, I've always preferred the layout of the Xbox controller over the PlayStation controller. I think the DualSense controller is Sony's best controller made, but I still find this controller more comfortable to use than the DualSense. 
Um, it's like, yeah, are there improvements they can make on this? Yes, of course. Just like with any controller. I still think this is a better controller than the, than the Switch Pro controller. Which is part of the reason why I don't even use a Pro controller on the Switch. I use the uh, 8-Bit Do uh, Ultimate controller because that's a more comfortable controller. So, there are things about the Xbox that I do prefer over the other platforms. But when it comes to first-party games, I think management is making excuses right now because they're probably looking at all of the studios they have and it's like there's really nothing coming out. So, my advice to anyone from Xbox watching this, which I highly doubt because it's not like I get that many views... Get rid of this hands-off approach you have towards game development. Start having deadlines. Start having um, start having like milestone uh, deadlines. You know, for for things in terms of game development. You know, you know if the con if the concept stage doesn't seem like it's going to work, or if it just seems generic, scrap it and do something else. I mean. You don't, you don't need to let studios continue making a game. And especially if you know... Um, yeah, Redfall is not looking too good right now. Um, yeah, let's just cut our losses, release it, see, see what we can get for it, and uh, move on. I mean, you know, you know what's really frustrating too? The it's Arcane, um, Arcane Austin is the developers. The last game they made was Prey. You know the remake of Prey. If you never played it, by the way, that's actually a really good game. Clearly, that studio knows how to make a really good game. The problem is, I don't know if if this project was. You know why, Beth? You know what? I, I don't. I don't want to start speculating, but Redfall, I think, was one of those games where it was being developed before Bethesda got purchased, and Bethesda was starting to get into that mindset of we need a live service game for everything that comes out going forward, and Redfall was just one of those projects. Apparently, I think. I don't, you know what? I, I don't want to start speculating because I don't, I don't know how anyone developing Redfall was looking at this like, you know, the, this game is going to be very successful. It's like, you know what? Yeah. In 2023, we're making a game that you are required to get your actual friends that you know in real life to play with you online. Why at the very Why at the very least with Redfall can you not just have random people just join your game and drop in drop out scenarios? Left for Dead did that and that's what came out what 20 years ago? 15 20 years ago? I mean this is not rocket science stuff. I'm not even a game developer. And I can look at the game and be like, this game is crap, okay? You can't even allow random people to join your game? Seriously? I mean, there could be people out there at least that, hey, you know, I just play games. I don't, I don't really care about having like a friends list or anything. I just want to play games and... You know, that's it. When you have a game in 2023 and you're requiring players to basically force people they know to play with you to enjoy the game, that is a problem right there. New generation was a clean slate and you could switch the whole console share. That's just not the world that we are in today. There is no world where... And just on the side note, that... This part where he's talking about. The other reason why this doesn't work either 
Look at what happened with Nintendo in the Wii U. They went from the Wii that was, you know, a pretty successful console. Say what you want about the software titles, you know, for the most part having a lot of shovelware. But it did sell over 100 million units. Going from the Wii to the Wii U, that did not even sell 20 million units. I think it only sold like 13, 14 million units. Okay, the Wii U. And I was one of those few that had a Wii U. Yes, I did put countless hours in that, into that console. Mainly because of the first party titles. But, you can't say that, oh, it's always a clean slate. Nintendo, for the most part, when it, when it comes to releasing new platforms, they're basically starting from scratch each time. Each generation of consoles when you release them is a clean slate the only reason why some people feel that oh going from like the ps4 the ps5 or you know the xbox one to the to the xbox series doesn't seem that big of a jump is because truthfully is really because of the games you know when the PS5 came out, you know, obviously, you know, during, you know, COVID, you know, it was kind of hard to find the consoles. So, so Sony made the decision during that time frame that the majority of first party titles were going to be PS4 and PS5. That's part of the reason why it felt like it wasn't really a big leap in console generations the problem is is that there's more the fact that there's more and more ps5s being being made available for people to purchase same thing with the xbox the difference is is that sony has their studios cranking out titles that are very high quality The way you win people over to your platform is quality first party titles. That's how you do it. Starfield's an 11 out of 10 and people start selling their PS5s. It's not going to happen. Um, so what we have to do, and we have this unique vision because we see what creators want to do. Creators want to build games that can meet players on any screen. People play with their friends regardless and look i'm not denying that the way microsoft is doing things with the xbox you know when it comes to like cloud gaming and you know having their games available in as many places as possible i think that's a good thing but at the same time that doesn't mean anything if you don't have good first party games if you don't have good quality games coming out then the service doesn't mean anything if it gets to the point that every single title you guys are releasing is absolute crap, have a different skew of Game Pass where it does not include first-party titles. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people would just downgrade to that and just skip the first-party titles at that point. Regardless of what other screen they're on. And the console is the core of the Xbox brand. There's no doubt. So... So like, we will stay focused on making sure that console experience is awesome. But I know some people want to hold us up of just being a better green version of what the blue guys do. Um, and I'm just going to say, like, there's not a win for Xbox in staying in the wake of somebody else. We have to go off and do our own thing with Game Bass, with the stuff we do with xCloud, and the way we build our games. Sorry, I was a little long-winded. No, that was perfect. No. And unfortunately, we do have to say goodbye to you, Phil. I know that we have a hard out here, but... I want to end it with something positive, Phil, because I've gotten cranky, Phil, this whole episode, and I freaking love you, and I appreciate you being on and being hard with us, but I do need something positive out of you, Phil. And by the way, what Phil was basically saying is that, yeah, um, yeah, our, our game studios that we have, they can't really make good games. So um, that's why we're doing this other stuff. Because uh, they're not doing their jobs properly. So, uh, 
you know, instead of, you know, having competent people in those studios, we're just, we're just going to do this other stuff and that's it. That's basically what he's saying. So before you leave, tell me and the Xbox community something positive that you're looking forward to, that you're playing, anything fun to bring a smile to your face. <laughs> Dude, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. Like, you know, I, I will always see, I'll use this for you, the gap between the trees. I'll always see the fresh pal. Like, this is why I'm here. Um, I love the games that are ahead of us. I'm having a great time playing the games that are available in Game Pass today. I look in Ravenlock coming, Benedict's here. Um, like, I, I just love playing video games. One of the things I am excited about um, is the ROG Ally, something I've got my hands on if people have had a chance to play with that. And I just love the fact that here's another device that people are gonna get to go experience great games on, whether it's your Steam Deck or that or your Xbox. You know, I see the growth in video games. I get to spend time with creators who are excited about the opportunity that they have. I get to go play some amazing games. Again, I don't have a problem with people basically choosing whatever device they want to play games on. You know, I'm not a fanboy when it comes to any of these platforms. I'm not a PlayStation fanboy. I'm not a Nintendo fanboy. I'm not an Xbox fanboy. What I am, though is I want to play good games. Whether it's multiplayer games or single player games. I just want to play good games that I find enjoyment in. That's all I care about. Okay? But when I download like Redfall, start playing it and be like, wow, this game is absolute garbage. Um, then, you start to, then I start to think, it's like, why am I paying for Game Pass at this point? Because I'll just say this too. And I'm actually working on the video. I actually made a video that, you know, I'm, it's going to come out next week. Though the way I was talking about this seemed like I had another video in the works. But I'm in the process of redoing the video for this. Because there were, there were some things in that video that I did not like that I'm going to basically redo it on. But what I will say is, is that I am slowly going, I am inching my way back towards strictly being a PC gamer. Even to the point where I'm like leaving the Switch behind also. Because, yes, in short, yes. Trying to run Windows on the Steam Deck kind of works, but there are some fundamental issues doing it with this way that wants me to get the ROG Ally instead and use that and have my Steam library, my Epic Games library, even my Xbox library all on that device. Again, I am not a console fanboy. I am not a... I'm not a fan of one singular platform. I just like playing good games. That's all I really care about. So... And... And what's really funny about this too is that you can go back to one of my old videos where I talk about... Did I make a video on that? I think I did where basically I explained why I sold my PS five and why I'm keeping the Xbox for the most part. The, the real reason why I still keep the Xbox is because when it comes to multimedia, you know, like when it comes to like the streaming apps and all that stuff, the Xbox still does a better job than the PlayStation five. Yes. I know most of the apps are kind of similar, but for me, there are things I do on the Xbox I just can't do on the PlayStation. So it's really frustrating that I basically have a console that I basically have a $500 console that I'm basically using as a streaming box for a bunch of different video apps. And 
and most of my game is actually being on PC. So I don't know. I mean, it's it's really getting to the point too. And I'll just I'll end it with this: is that if you're someone that is really really strapped for cash, and you're looking at all these different devices to look at, and yes, I am gonna say this here. And yes, I am going to say this now. Sorry, my my uh, my Nest device was apparently thought I was. Anyway, so here's the thing. In this video right now, I'm basically going to say that yes, I am interested in getting one of those RG Ally handhelds. Probably going to get the higher spec version, of course. And I'm most likely going to sell off the Steam Deck. Why? Because trying to run Windows on the Steam Deck, even to this day, not all that great. The ROG Ally is being purposely built to run Windows on it. So obviously the experience on that is going to be much better because... They have Windows in mind when building that thing. Plus, it's going to be more capable. And on top of that, if you're someone that's actually strapped for cash and you either want to have like a, you know, place to play games on, and let's just say you're someone that is looking at the Switch, you know, for portable play, a device like that kind of makes more sense. Yes, the upfront cost might be more. But when you think about it, it's like, you know, there are ways that you can play games on it that's either really, really cheap or actually free. So one of the things you can do is, if you don't already, get yourself an Epic Games account and have the Epic Games launcher, you know, the Epic Games program on your computer. Okay. And get this. They give away games on that service as an incentive for you to use the service. So just to prove a point, I'm going to open up my Epic Games program right now. And how many games do I have on here right now? I have 162 games. Well, Actually, I think some of them are like um, add-ons to other games and and things like that. So, let's just say about 150 games. 150, 155. So, about 150 or so games. I think I only bought maybe like four or five games total through Epic Games. The rest of it was all free. You can literally buy one of those ROG allies, even the top spec one. And you don't really have to worry about buying any games if you have Epic Games installed on it. Something to think about. And I'm not talking about like garbage games either. I'm talking about like the Bioshock games. You know, the Batman games. You know, Batman Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Arkham Knight. Bioshock Infinite, of course, Bioshock Remaster 1 and 2, uh, the Assassin's Creed games. You know, if, if you want to include like games like Fortnite, Fall Guys, um, Evil Dead the game, Dead by Daylight, Dishonored, uh, Dying Light. I mean, we're, we're not talking about, like, garbage games here. We're talking about, like, legitimately good games. Just Cause 4, uh, the Lego Batman games, uh, Metro 2033. Hell, even Prey, which is actually a good game. That was free. Um...
Hell, even Tomb Raider. Civilization 4. Um, Stubbs the Zombie. Sims 4. Did I say Tomb Raider? Wolfenstein the New Order. XCOM 2. You know, we're... We're talking about like legitimate good games here. So actually, you know what? If I go to the store, because, you know, they always have free games going on. So the three games they have for free right now, as of this video, until May 11th, is Against All Odds, Horizon Chase Turbo, and KO the Kangaroo. So, and, those, and all three of those are really good games, by the way. So, like I said before, there are ways, you know, Xbox Game Pass is not necessarily like the best value because truthfully, the best value is, you know, the free games that you can claim through Epic Games. So, because you don't have to pay anything out of pocket. So, so no. Xbox Game Pass, whether you get the cheap one or the ultimate version, that's not like the best value in gaming. Yes, there are a lot of games you can play. The problem is, is that you have to keep paying for the service to have access to those games. There are other ways to get games for cheap or free. And as long as you still have the account with them, you don't have to pay anything. So this is what's really frustrating and why I don't buy the fact that, oh, we can't compete on, you know, quality first party games. Because there are ways to just play games that you can literally actually play for free. So... In, Yes, I do. I am aware that this video is almost an hour long, but it's really important to understand. And at least where I'm coming from here is that there are ways to play games on the cheap. You got the high quality games, you know, from Nintendo and Sony. And you have on the other end, either mobile games on the phone or you can get free games through Epic Games. And I think Steam does this too every once in a while. But Epic Games is really aggressive on that. So, where does Microsoft fit into this then? The way they have to fit in is to provide quality first party games if you're going to expect people to continue paying for Xbox Game Pass. Like, if I'm going to be expected to continue paying $15 a month. So, 15 times 12. So, Microsoft, if you're going to expect me to keep paying $180 each year to continue paying for the service, I'm also expecting first party titles. Where are they? The last one you came out with is absolute garbage. So, sorry, I, I don't I don't buy this that, oh, they can't, you know, compete, you know, with the likes of Nintendo and Sony when it comes to games and stuff like that. I just, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I just think they just need to get their studios in gear and just start cranking games out. The problem is, is that they're not doing anything. What? Just on a side note here, what was the last game? What was the last game Rare came out with? Seriously, what was the last thing they came out with? So 
So in 2018, Sea of Thieves. The, to be fair, that game was a little rough when it came out, but apparently it's much better now. Battletoads was crap. But before that, you know, it was Rare Replay and then the Connect Sports games. Yes, I am aware of Killer Instinct, but the truth is, look at this. In 2018, we're in 2023, by the way. The last legitimate good game Rare came out with was Sea of Thieves. That was in 2018. That was five years ago. And supposedly, from what I've been hearing about Everwild, is that the trailer they came out with was really designed in a way that you're not really supposed to know what the game is about because even, at least at the time, even Rare had no idea what this game was going to be. And I think that's part of the problem right there is that they have studios just making things, but they have no clear direction on what kind of game they want to make either. It's more like, hey, I have this idea. Let's just start making this. Um, I have no idea what kind of gameplay this is going to be or anything or what type of, you know, style game this is going to be. But, uh, yeah, I have this, you know, artsy style looking thing in mind. But... But in 2019 is when this was announced. And look, this right here. A video, uh, a video game chronicles report on June 14, 2021, uh, corroborated that Everwild underwent a complete reboot after after departure of creative director Simon uh, Wood uh, Woodroth. But stay that is planned release day has been pushed back to 2024, saying Everwild's development team is now optimistically targeting a 2024 release so originally it was supposed to be a 2023 game then it did a complete reboot and now it's going to be an additional year and this is rare i mean what's what's also frustrating too is that you know like for example this game is being developed in unreal engine 5 so we saw a presentation not too long ago from Epic that, hey, we have tools now that you can basically just have an AI generated landscape so that, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, placing things, you know, wasting time placing things. You can just just have like a blank slate and then just start putting things in place. The whole point is to make game development, you know, quicker. But yet, it doesn't seem to be. So, I don't know. And, you know, if we look at this gameplay section here. Uh, as Everwild is in development, with few details announced, description of its gameplay vary. In 2020, the game was described as a third-person adventure game with elements taken from God games. In more recent reports suggest the game is set to have no combat whatsoever. So, what kind of gameplay is it supposed to be? I don't know. You know what? We'll see what happens with Everwild, but 
I'll be honest with you, a lot of the first party games coming from my, from Xbox, I personally don't care because it's been back to back to back, you know, Halo Infinite, complete disappointment. The multiplayer side of it, complete disappointment. Um, Redfall, complete disappointment. Um, you know, Grounded is supposed to be a good game now. The problem is, is that they released the game as an early, basically like an early beta type game. And they slowly been improving on the game. But the problem is, is that they treat it like a launch type for, you know, a new release title. So I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand how Microsoft can just release games in broken, in broken states. And you have Sony and Nintendo releasing games that, that not only just works, but are actually fun with very, very few issues in terms of bugs and, and gameplay issues and things like that. I don't, I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. So I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense. The messaging Phil Spencer is talking about doesn't match up with the business side of Microsoft acquiring studios. So if coming out with quality first party games isn't a, isn't a focus for you, then why, why is the company spending billions of dollars trying to acquire studios to make first party titles? It doesn't make sense. So what are your thoughts down below? Leave those comments down below. Like I always have a good one clocking in over an hour here. So I'll end it here. Like always have a good one until next time.